Alright guys, this is a long plane review for Beyond the Ice Palace on the Amstrad CPC. Released by Elite Systems in 1988. And uh, now this is often spoke of as the unofficial sequel to Ghosts and Goblins on the uh, home computers that were popping in Europe at the time. Because uh, two years previously, Elite released that conversion to great sales and success. But I can find no evidence for some assertions online stating that this was intended to be an actual sequel, uh, but they just couldn't get the license for it. Rather, I instead believe that Elite just wanted to emulate that success with a similar game. And here it is two years later, Beyond the Ice Palace. And guys, we've got um, a nice intro sequence sort of coming up here, and I'm going to let the music play in full. Uh, but the game footage itself will probably start around about the 7 uh, minute 30 second mark. But being this is a long play, we're going to uh, make sure everything is played in full, which is including the music. Because it is really, really good and nicely presented, as you can see too. We actually get two pieces of music here. A short piece we're hearing now. And uh, this piece on the intro sequence. And uh, I'll just read this out because this is actually the story of the game. And it's the same in the manual and on the back of the box. So, beyond the ice palace and to the north, legend tells of a mystical land where strange creatures dwell. This is a land of fantasy and magic, of goblins and dragons, of good and evil. Recently, there have been great upsets in the balance of good and evil in these lands. The forces of evil have been burning down the forests and destroying the homes and lives of the simple woodcutters. <laughs> One night, a meeting was held between the ancient and wise spirits of the woods. A decision was made to appoint a single person to be responsible for returning this balance to the land once again by banishing the evil back from whence it came. They blessed a sacred arrow with the powers of the woods which would summon a spirit in times of need and shot it into the air. Whoever found the arrow would find themselves in an adventure of fantastic importance. <laughs> there we go. Now this will like, um, that story will loop around another two more times roughly before the music finishes and that, that starts to loop itself. So well this is the music in full because it, it really is excellent music uh, by the always excellent David Whittaker. I really don't need to go through all his other games on the Amstrad because there were so many and, and pretty much every soundtrack he ever did was always great. Always great tunes. And I think he was probably the most prolific and consistently excellent musician on the Amstrad by, by a country mile. And I love Ben Dalgleish's work and all that kind of stuff. And there's Matthew Cannon, Jonathan Don, and uh, quite a few others. But David Whittaker, he just kept churning out the tunes and would always hit a home run with them. So well done David Whittaker here. Now, the coder responsible for this game is David Perry. Yes, the very same David Perry, who's now gone on to such fame and fortune and is a massive, massive success. But he was also responsible for many classics on the Amstrad CPC, such as Trantor, Savage, Teenage Mutant Hero Turtles, Dan Dare Free, Extreme, um, Smash TV, and, and more. And uh, David Perry is kind of a bit of a hero on the uh, Amstrad scene. Now, if you're not uh, if you're not an Amstrad fan, I don't know the history of the Amstrad. He's he, uh, in the scene. David Perry is kind of regarded as a bit of a god, really, a programming god and coder, responsible for some really fast, smooth scrolling games with brilliant animation and effects and all this kind of stuff. Um, in fact, it was really his conversion of Trantor that made a lot of people sit up and take notice of the Amstrad and that it could actually scroll and scroll fastly and smoothly because so many programmers beforehand just struggled and just couldn't do it. 
But David, David Perry was handed the task of getting the Spectrum version of Trantor onto the Amstrad. And within, I think, uh, a night or two, um, apparently, he got it strolling. And not only did he get it scrolling nicely, it actually got it scrolling much faster and smoother than the Specky version and just blew everyone away in the company. And it kind of um, readjusted the uh, perception of the Amstrad in the eyes of uh, popular media, the magazines at the time, seen VGs and all that kind of stuff, because had, the Amstrad had this bad reputation of not being able to scroll games. <laughs> no thanks to like games like Green Beret a few years earlier and such like. And here, here came David Perry in a couple of nights, got it scrolling nice and fast and smooth and blew everyone away. And uh, obviously went on to uh, bigger and better conversions like Beyond the Ice Palace and the other four aforementioned games. Um, so yes, and obviously he's a very, very successful man now, living out in America, multi-millionaire I believe. <laughs> I think he is. So he's probably one of the biggest success stories of the programming days in the uh, mid to late 80s. And it was all on the Amstrad. So we have, we have to be very proud of David Perry. Um, graphics by uh, Nigel Brownjohn, whose only other graphic work on the CPC is Hijack for Activision. So the music just started looping there, so that's why we're moving on. And uh, after Beyond the Ice Palace, uh, Nigel, he moved on to the Atari ST and uh, didn't look back to the 8 bits. So there we go. That's the people behind the game. Just going to set our keys here and then we're going to kick things off. Right. And we start above a cave system here and there's three weapons you can choose. There's a little dagger. Uh, there's a sword, very Ghost and goblins -y. and a mace, which I think in Ghost and Goblins is like an axe. But make sure you jump here before you fall down because you're likely to fall down straight onto one of these horrible little green bats, which caused me a lot of bother. And as you can see, you guys, really nice graphics, but like it's, it's the animation on the main sprite. It looks absolutely fantastic. Really, really smooth. Uh, responsive tight controls, but again, as I mentioned earlier, um, really lovely smooth scrolling on the Amstrad, guys. Woo! <laughs> so this is really solid. Lovely particle explosion effects as well. Kind of a trademark of uh, Dave Perry's games, like Savage and Tranta. Uh, oh, these, these green winged devil things are really, really annoying. Um, they're kind of the equivalent of the gargoyles in uh, Ghosts and Goblins. They move in a weird kind of erratic pattern. It's hard to predict. Um, uh, but these guys also shoot sort of uh, like gold daggers out at you or fireballs. So they're, they're a real pain in the arse. You have to dispatch of them really quickly like so. Take the higher route here. It's a little bit easier going up the ladder and going around the top here. And there's another one that spawns there. He's below me, so it's going to be really hard to hit him. So I'm just going to peg it and just completely avoid him, essentially. And there we go. And we move to like the second half of level one. And you get the way back is blocked. There's another one of them that spawn, spawns down there. And there's usually about three uh, green bats above our head on this lift section, which is the toughest part of level one. So I've just used one of the spirits. Now the spirits is like a special attack. And as you can see, you start with two of them and you can collect more of them throughout the game. But you can only hold two at a time. Now that spirit, I, I, I kind of let it go a little bit too early, but I think it actually killed the three green bats that are normally lurking around here. And they're not there anymore. Or they failed to spawn for some weird glitchy reason. But I've never known that happened, so I'll probably destroy them there. Pick up jewels there for points. Um, avoid this, we want to keep the mace. And here's the boss of level 1, and I'm using one of these spirit attacks. Uh, it's a green dragon, going to destroy all the parts of the body, and then destroy the head. And he shoots lightning bolts out at you. And I've done it. He's actually the hardest boss in the game, actually, guys. <laughs> and it's on level 1. And there we go. So here we are on level 2. Um, so, yeah, the game has only three levels they are three decently sized levels uh, but that's it 
Um, so the game is over rather quickly if you can beat it. As you can see, guys, it's a fairly short long play video. A good third of it was taken up just by the intro and all the music, so there you go. Um, but it is very tough and frustrating. It's a very difficult game, and I'm kind of making it look easy because, well, this is a long play video, and I'm attempting to beat this um, without losing a life. But it took me a long time to do, you guys, and I don't think I want to try and repeat that again. It drove me absolutely insane trying to do that. In fact, this was actually scheduled for last week, um, last Monday's long play video, but I ran out of time. I didn't beat it in time. I didn't beat it, or I didn't beat it sufficiently without losing a life. So um, uh, I did it again this week, and here we are. Um, but yes, you do, um, talking about difficulty though, uh, like a cat, it does actually give you nine lives. So it is very completable, considering you've only got three levels. You might be able to just bluster your way through. Uh, but generally, you want to take your time and be patient and always be firing and not rush into things. Oof! One of them spawned right at me on the ladder. This guy's going to be difficult to get rid of. Oof! Lucky there, but I did it. Um, hmm. What can I talk about now? Let's talk about the other versions of the games um, on the other systems. So the Zelix Spectrum, um, I'm kind of surprised to see that the scrolling is not as smooth as the CPC. In fact, the uh, Specky scrolling is a little bit juddery, um, especially static sprites. Uh, and when the when the actual screen scrolls, they look really bad, sort of wobbling all over the place. Oh, we've just picked up the best weapon in the game, like this gold dagger thing. It does the most amount of damage, and we need it to kill the final boss, I believe, so keep that. Um, so yeah, some static sprites wobbling all over the place in the specy version, not good. Um, but it still scrolls pretty, pretty decently. Um, the weapons don't seem to shoot as fast, it seems. So if you hit a target, you want to fire again. There seems to be a little bit of delay. Maybe it was just an, an emulation issue, I'm not sure. Um, and the enemies sometimes behave a little bit slightly differently. Um, otherwise, it's very close to the CPC version, uh, but with less color. Uh, similar graphics though, and sound effects the same, with the same, and it has the same map layout. Uh, it possibly shares some code of the CPC version, but it honestly looks like David Perry was asked to do his own Amstrad conversion rather than a quick specy port. So it feels like we've kind of got a bespoke version of the game, which is really cool. Normally you get like um, specy ports or um, the, about 80% of the code is the specy version or something like that. And the Amstrad can then kind of suffers for that. So that's good. Amstrad got its own version by the looks of it. Um, the Commodore 64. Um, it plays ridiculously fast. And uh, you can actually complete it in under five minutes. Uh, as you expect, it plays very smooth. Has music throughout the game. And it's the same tune that we heard on the title screen. Um, although no sound effects. Um, hmm. What else to mention? Um, I'd say the graphics aren't quite as nice as the Amstrad CPC version. It may come down to personal preference on that. Um, so weighing things up, both the CPC and the C64 versions are on a par with each other. It just depends if you fancy playing this at a really stupidly fast speed, or you prefer kind of like the graphics of the Amstrad version. Uh, and, the, and the more slower pace, but it's not exactly a slow game. Finally, stretch of the imagination. So there we go. Um, moving on get, uh, to the 16-bit versions, and uh, it came out the Amiga and the Atari ST. The Amiga, interestingly, um, the Amstrad and Specky graphics artist Nigel Brownjohn did the graphics on the Amiga too, and definitely the sprites and animation look very, very similar. In fact, the Amiga like main sprite of our character we're playing as here and its animation looks identical to the Amstrad version, which is kind of cool, actually. Here's a boss of level two, by the way. Don't worry about the red, like, fat bee. Just go for the gold or brown colored one, and it will destroy all the other red bees around it. And there's actually about two or three other bees that we didn't see off the other side of the screen there. But they all died at once when he killed the main uh, boss there. Uh, not a particularly hard boss. In fact, as I mentioned earlier, the level one boss is the hardest. 
Um, talking about the Amiga version, um, it has the same David Whittaker music, uh, but obviously using the uh, Amiga's excellent instruments uh, and sounds much better for it, of course. And that plays throughout the game, and it also has sound effects. Oh yeah, use a spirit here because we get a repeat of uh, the level one boss here, and he's the toughest git in the game. <laughs> uh, the Amiga version is as fast as the Commodore 64 version, by the way, and plays a smooth tube, of course. So it's probably the best version overall, um, but um, it has the same layout, enemies, etc., as the 8-bit versions. It even has the same ending and high score table entry too. And it's just amazing how all the versions from the 8-bit to 16-bit are pretty much identical to each other. Certainly the Spectrum version looks a little bit different graphic-wise, um, but otherwise the same map layout and stuff like that. So strange to see that, um, but all three versions are the same. And the 16-bit versions don't add anything extra or new to it. Um, and of course, lastly, the Atari ST. This is unsurprisingly the same as the Amiga, but has the Amstrad CPC music uh, playing throughout because both the Atari ST and the Amstrad share an AY chip, um, AY sound chip. So there we go. So the Amiga is slightly better, maybe, because of the better music. Um, as for uh, magazine review scores at the time, I always like to go and try and find the Amstrad Action Review. Um, it was a the magazine for games on the Amstrad, uh, so I don't bother looking at uh, ACU or any of the any other Amstrad magazines. Um, so this was reviewed in issue 33, which is June 1988. Um, they generally liked the game, but noted that a lot of frustration creeps in with some areas of unavoidable deaths. Hmm, like the very start of the game, I suppose. Um, but to be fair, there's only really sort of two or three places where you'd need to kind of have played the game before to know and expect something evil is about to come up. Like, for example, here, I know that there's a one of those guys spawns to the right there, another to the left, and you've got to smash them really quickly, and forethought of that, and foreknowledge, uh, obviously, is going to get you through there without losing your life. But there's only, like, a few places that that happens. Um... Ooh, um, is this the boss here? I think we might be the boss. Um, yes, this is the final boss. Don't know what he is, evil wizard. He sometimes shoots out lightning bolts, but he just shuffles left and right. Not doing much, really. And is the easiest boss in the game. Amstrad Action marked the game down for no music. So I don't know if the intro was missing on their review copy or on the tape version, but I assume it's there on the tape version. Uh, but they gave graphics a rather low 73% considering. Oh, there we go. We've de we've beaten it. <laughs> and that's the ending, just a one screen here. Well done. You have vanquished evil from the land. And that's your lot. Blimey. Um, they gave Sonics 39%. Like, what the hell are they talking about? There's some, there was some excellent music there and decent sound effects in game. Maybe they really marked it down because there was no music in game, but very strange. Um, and they're, they're often sometimes very strange for their scoring. Um, they gave Grab Factor 78%, Staying Power 74%, and an overall rating of 77%. So there we go. I think that's a rather harsh score, guys. Um, I was going to perhaps give this game run about, an, uh, you know, it's, it's, given its technical um, technical stuff going on here and how smoothly it plays, I'd rather give this like an 8.5 or a 9 out of 10. However, the game is too short. It is overly difficult and frustrating in places. Like, for example, you drop down here, you're guaranteed to pretty much hit a, um, a green bat straight away. Very nice death sequence, though, which I thought I'd just show you here, guys. Um, so I do have to mark it down for those things. And I think it's fair overall to give this an 8 out of 10. Yeah, 8 out of 10. Because to be honest, guys, now I've beaten it, I don't have much, um, well, feeling to come back and give this another play. I'll probably play this again in maybe a year or two's time. Um, I'm kind of done with the game, so it's not going to draw me back for another blast, I don't think, for a long time. As such, that's why I'm giving this an 8 out of 10. So, more of an answered action, maybe less than some people uh, would give it, because there's a lot of people really love this game, so... Uh, but I think 8 out of 10 is still a very high score, and very good. But it's a very good game. So there we go, guys. Thank you very much for watching, and uh, goodbye!
So thanks for watching guys, I hope you enjoyed that. If you did, please click a like below, leave a comment and also subscribe if you haven't already. And over that way, there's another video for you to check out. Zypho, out.